Empire. Hello and welcome to my podcast. Do me a favor, subscribe to the John Com Report wherever you get your podcast. You're watching on YouTube, like button, subscribe button. You can find us there as part of Empire Media, A-M-P-I-R-E. Always much appreciated. Today, I'm joined by the voice of the commanders, Bram Weinstein. We dig into a lot of topics. The most relevant of one is the quarterback decision, of course. Ron Rivera said they're sticking with Taylor Heineke, so we discuss that. We're going to talk about that for more than a few minutes because it's a very important one. And as you guys all know, you're debating it amongst yourselves. And so we're going to do the same thing for you and just get some insight to you. So that's what we're going to talk about. And then there, there's going to be some other topics in there. We're going to talk about the defense, the run game. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about Chase Young, just warning you. I know you guys are tired of it. Trust me when I say they're tired of answering the question. We're tired of asking it because it feels like it's been the same thing every week. But as long as he's there and he's not on IR, he's going to be asked about because it's a relevant topic. And I'm telling you, the beginning of a lot of these weeks, he feels pretty good. And then by the end of the week, there's still something that maybe he's unsure about. So that's, but that's why there's this roller coaster ride. And they did bring in Dr. Andrews um, on Sunday to check him out, said the knee was good. I think that was done as much to, to um, help young feel better about getting back on the field. So we'll see where this goes again, but I, but it's near the end of the conversation. So if you don't want to listen to any more of that, you can listen up until that point. Anyway, about the quarterback, I think it's going to be very interesting to watch because with Rivera, you're running out of time and you know how important these games are. And this is no longer about protecting anybody, protecting somebody's, you know, or worrying about the locker room. You've got to make the decision that you feel is best for the organization and for the team. So if Washington comes out and they're struggling in the red zone again, do you make that move? Do you think that Carson Wentz could be the answer in the red zone? If you do, then you make that move. What if you're not moving the ball and you're down by two or three touchdowns at halftime? Well, then you're going to make that move because you're going to be looking for something. And then I think you're wor- then I think you might look at it and say, okay, going forward now, I have to worry about that. So is that where you go? And for the last couple of games, you go to Wentz. We'll see. I think this is everything's on the table at this point because this is now about survival and trying to get a playoff spot more than anything else. So that's why these coaches get the big bucks to make these kinds of decisions. And I'll be curious to see where this thing goes. Of course, if they go out there and Heineke's playing well, they convert in the red zone, or it's not the offense's fault that they're not winning or something like that, then he'll stay in the game. It's really, it's kind of that simple, I think, at this point in the season. Anyway, Bram and I get into all that and a few other topics as well. One other thing to note, today is Tuesday, so I'll be back out at Commander's Facility for they have a little walkthrough t- Tuesday afternoon, practice Wednesday, Thursday. Go, they're going out to San Francisco on Friday. And so we'll we'll have the updates from, from the facility, injuries, et cetera, et cetera. But, um, so there you go. Just want to give a heads up. You want to find out anything that's going on, hit me up on e- or hit up at ESPN.com. Find me out on Twitter at John underscore Kime. There you go. Now, let's get to my conversation with the voice of the commanders, Bram Weinstein. Bram, let's start with this, because we talked to Ron Rivera on Monday, and he made the statement that Taylor Heineke is going to be starting in San Francisco. But the rest of it was pretty much, you know, as long as he gets back to doing what he's been doing. What did you make of his comments about Heineke, and especially because the other guy would be Carson Wentz, but what did you make of the his um, comments about Heineke and continuing to start and, and all that he said there? I thought it was honest. Um, we've been talking about it for a few weeks. I've been saying this for a while. I see a path to Carson Wentz playing again, assuming he's healthy and just seeing how the offense was going. Um, you know, I want to make any grandiose, um, you know, overarching statements about it because you easily like start to come to a conclusion that some of this has run its course. Um, I don't know if it has, or it hasn't. I was a little surprised coming out. I was hoping the buy would recharge them. I'm surprised by the output, both sides of the ball, frankly, um, and just the, just the loss. Really, you know, I'm I'm surprised still today, um, but I don't think that this is, in my opinion, this feels like something that was always in play. The second Wentz was healthy and able to go and back up to speed, that if things did not improve significantly with the offense in terms of getting more points, frankly. 
um, that I think um, that this was always something that was going to be out there. And now they're in a spot where, you know, the season's on the line. So that's a very tricky decision for Ron Rivera to make. It is. Um, and when you look at this, because he's obviously, I think he's going to start. Do you think that if there's another first half struggle that he would pull him, or is this a tough team to put Wentz in against? Um, I'm not going to lie to you. I thought at halftime last night, you know, that there was possibility that he was going to make a change. Like I just, the way it was going, um, you know, I didn't expect it going in, but I thought it was possibility after the way the first half went was played. Um, and this weekend, um, I would think it'd have to be pretty bad for him to pull him, but I do feel like if they lose and I'm not going to project out at this point, this early in the week that I think they will. I mean, obviously this is a formidable opponent who's hot right now, but, um, you know, I'm, I'm, they have given us examples of times they've even this year where they've won games where no one expected them to win against really good teams. A couple of them on the road, like Pittsburgh, 2020 Eagles sure. earlier this year, Tampa Bay out of a bye last year. So I don't put anything past them. Um, and so, you know, I, I don't, I don't know. I, I have a feeling though, if they lose, I do think there's going to be and depending on how the game goes, obviously, but if they lose, um, I do think an, an interesting conversation is going to happen post Christmas. I do too. And I, th- and then a lot of it's going to depend on, on how the offense looks. How much do you put on Heineke? How much do you put on play calls? Scott Turner's play calls? Where do you, how do you divvy this up? And that's what the, you know, is this all about Heineke? No, <laughs> no, no. Um, you know, I think there's a big, I think there's a big overarching story that starts back in the preseason with the offensive line, uh, with the addition of, um, some weapons like Jahan Dotson and getting Curtis Samuel back. And, you know, it's interesting. Like they, um, gave up two major assets and $28 million for this year alone for Carson Wentz. They used the first round pick on a receiver. They gave Terry McLaurin a top five, top 10 receiver money contract. Um, that screams at you vertical passing game. Um, I don't think that their offensive line was built initially to accommodate it. Um, I also felt like in the summer that, you know, this is just my opinion, but we talked about it a lot that, you know, they might've been better served being more of a run offense, being a play action offense, um, getting Wentz comfortable in this offense, building back some of his own personal competence. If he needed it, you know, I don't really know because he doesn't really share a lot, but like you could understand over the course of what happened over the last 12 to 18 months that he might need a little help. And we described it as give him some layups, you know, get the ball out of his hands, hit it to these guys like Gibson, McLaurin, Samuel, Dotson, maybe good things just happen, you know, like they start making all these plays because they're dynamic playmakers and let them do the work for you and then build up from there. And I think that they came out personally um, with an offense that like, it was like they wanted to go gangbusters, like right off the bat. And it backfired on them very quickly when the protection schemes broke down on them and Wentz's, you know, um, inability to be particularly mobile, you know, I think hurt them. When you listen to Ron Rivera today, Monday, and he's talking about what is your identity? And I, I think it's a big question about what did we see against the Giants that suggested that's their identity. But when he talks about it, I think we all agree they're a run first offense, even with all these weapons. Well, offensive line's blocking better now, albeit juggling people. I think they are more of a different offense. And I think a round two with Wentz, with this more pronounced rush offense that goes into a play action offense, would give us a better sense of what his real future is with this team, as opposed to what they were doing early in the season. So I'm kind of interested in seeing it personally. Do you think, because would we see the play calling early in the year? I know there was you know, some talk internally where you're relying a little bit too much on trying to throw the ball because you got these weapons. We know that. So would, do you think that they would go back? They would stick with what they're doing, but insert Wentz into that without changing it. And, you know, because I think that's the question, like, do do you you become a little bit greedy? Do you think, what do you think? I think you have to, but I don't know. I'm not confident that they will, that they would. Yeah, I don't know. I I um I do because you know Rivera does set the tone for what he wants. Yeah, um, and yes, he, yeah, he does. So when he purposefully says we're a power run offense, that's I think he means that regardless of who the quarterback is, and that's where 
here are the things I remember like in studying Wentz after they had acquired him. Like what I didn't like about his game was slow developing plays, stuff where he had to be on the move. He'd become inaccurate. He'd make some mistakes, you know, make some bad choices. That's where, you know, if you want to have a conversation about Heineke, I like him on the move. I like the decisions he makes. They don't always all work out, but I like the decisions largely that he makes, which is why I like him moving more than being a pocket quarterback. I like Wentz more in the pocket making quick decisions, but what he's really good at intermediate throws and ball fakes and play action. And we all know that, and and this is what this team needs with these playmakers. They need a true deep passing threat game. Well, he gives you that. Now, will he be particularly accurate in it? I don't know, but like he certainly offers it. And I think a defense has to honor it a little bit different than what Heineke provides them in that regard. So I think they have two different skill sets. I think we have found that like lately this offense feels like it's maxing out. And at times in the red zone and in third down conversions, it's just not good enough, in my opinion. And I think they'll be the first to admit that in in crunch moments. It's just not happening. I'm not going to blame Heineke or blame Turner or blame anybody, but it's just not happening collectively. And it does read like the offense needs another injection of something. And not unlike when Heineke came in and they needed exactly what he provided them. It does feel like with this newly formed and to your point and outwardly, you know, like this is what we do mantra coming down from above. I'd like to see what that looks like. But frankly, I'm rooting for them to win. So if Heineke goes out there and pulls off an upset in San Francisco, I'm not pulling them out against oh, Cleveland. No, no, and it's all no. status quo to me. So yeah. like I'm not I'm not advising this or advocating for it. I want them to win this weekend so they're back in the playoff chase again and they knock off a really good team and there's a really good buzz about what the end of the season looks like. And if that happens under Heineke's watch, awesome. Can't wait to see him play against Cleveland. Yeah, and you know the one thing too with with Rivera making these announcements, it's really the first time that it's there's been a true decision because, and I didn't think there really was going to be a decision. I thought that my understanding all along would be that you'd give if Heineke had a bad game, they're not going to just automatically pull him because they they know that there are some a lot of things to consider there. But it's really the first because previously when we asked him about the decision, well, Wentz wasn't ready to play. Well, he is now, so I think it just becomes a little bit more. Um, of an issue, but I also wonder too, Bram. Sometimes with with Heineke, they love how the the um, how he played against Tampa a couple of years ago is because nothing to lose. And sometimes I wonder if they kind of like putting him in that spot, just because it may does it bring out the best in him. If you put him in a situation like, hey, if you don't play well, we might just pull you. And so now you know what I mean. Like, does it does it does it insert something into him? I don't know. That might be a little bit of a stretch, but. I mean, listen, this Ron Rivera has paid a lot of money to make very difficult decisions. If they were to lose this weekend, they will have to win their final two games to make the playoffs. And that's a really interesting decision to have to make. Are we really going to go back to a different quarterback at that point? Um, And I guess we'll see when we get there. But again, I'm hoping they win. Like they figure something out. They win. They, They pull this out, too. They've already done it once this year. There's no reason why they can't do it again. They've shown a history of doing this. So, and I don't know if you've watched the NFL over the last couple of weeks, seems to me that every game comes down to the last minute and there are teams like the Texans that are playing in overtime with the chiefs or Jacksonville is coming back from 17 against Dallas or 33 point halftime comebacks. So at this juncture right now, I'll believe anything really. Right. And I, I think it's why you can't discount anything from happening. And, and it's why when, you know, people say, well, just, you know, they're not going to go anywhere. You don't know because this, this is a crazy, crazy, crazy league. Um, you know, the other thing, funny thing, Bram, and I haven't been able to finish all watching the game. This is my, we're taping this Monday night because my eyes weren't staying open very long. Had to write some stories, blah, blah, blah. But some of the stuff I watched and like people want to get Heineke's legs more involved in the offense. And he had his own read run, but they ran a couple other times where it's like, I don't know why he didn't keep the ball. And, and this is one where they, they, they had a true, like a triple threat RPO and he fakes. And it was, a, it was, a, it was when they were, I think it was one of the first field goal drive. So it's around the 40 yard line or something like that. No inside, maybe the 25, somewhere, somewhere in there. And a little, he gives the ball. I think it was to Robinson who loses two yards, but he loses two yards because Thibodeau is already sliding and going at Robinson. And if he, if he pulls it, He's got the corner and if the he's, he's got the edge. And if the corner comes up, you just throw to Jahan Dotson, who probably gets 25 yards 
and maybe even scores on it. It's like, it's that well set up. And it's just, I just thought of it because we were talking about his legs and all that, but um, you know, just things that he does, but you'd like to see more of that. And that's where for people who always say, get his legs more involved. It's the decision-making on that zone read that also matters to who runs the ball. And that's what it is. It's not a designed run for a quarterback. It's a yeah. design choice by the quarterback. But anyway, I just, I like, for some reason, I was like, that part of it too, Bram, I'm looking at these plays and you're looking at these games, like which play could have made the difference for you in this game. In addition to all, you know, some of the bad calls that we saw, you know, what other plays that they can control that. And that's, that's one of them. But anyways, that's a little bit of a digression. So. Um, I, I, I don't know. It's funny. I don't advocate for him to have designed a lot of design. No, I don't either. I, Come but I, what I like, I don't know. It's like a, uh, He's Brett Favre light. Like I, I, I trust him to make decisions, but I think he just plays better when he's moving. And so it's not like, it's not set up a zone read run for him or anything. I think it's more like, how do we get him moving? Because he seems to perform better in those situations or when, or when things get a little more heightened, he seems to perform better. So how do we make that happen in the first half for him? How do you replicate it? Maybe that's impossible, but how do you do it? And that's where I really like his game. It's funny. Like when I watch him play, I feel like I'm almost watching like a drama, like a dramatized version of football at times. It's like, <laughs> like this is what it would look like in a movie if they just let the guy play. You know what I mean? Like it's not, and that's probably what Rivera and Turner probably see too, where they're like, we want more structure, we want decision making, we want all these things to happen, and there are these moments of magic with him. Um, but there's not enough to score more than 17 points a game, and that ultimately puts them on the razor's edge of every single game that they play. And I remember when I talked to Rivera a few weeks ago and I talked about every, they're winning all these games, but they're all close. And his answer was to me, he was like, what's wrong with winning 17 to 16. And I said, nothing, but I'm like looking at him going like, you know, you're not going to always be the team getting 17 in that case. Like there's a lot wrong with losing 17. It's a lot wrong with losing 17 to 16. If that's what it is every week. So like, look at the giants right now. Like, they never played from ahead the entire season. They were seven and two with six fourth quarter comebacks. Like they were playing on the razor's edge the whole year. And I know that's a lot of the league, but I'd like to see this team with these weapons start to actually separate themselves and just score more points than they score. And that's, I think is ultimately the part of this at this point in the season, Heineke or Wentz that I'm a little surprised hasn't materialized. And I know some of it's the protection and the line. I get it. But like, I love their skill set position players like they top to bottom have an incredible set of, of playmakers and it's not adding up to enough points. on right. weekly. And and I'm not going to just blame the offensive line for all that either, because the line like the line isn't that bad where they shouldn't be more productive as an offense. And so, you know, why is that? Because like you look at it last night, Brian Robinson's running well. You have Dotson, McLaurin, Samuel, all of whom, like, look at Dotson is a such a good receiver and will continue to get better. But so you look at that, like they have this, they have this, they have this. Why is it they can't score more than 20 points? And and you know, and and you know, you look at, you know, is it Scott Turner? Does he does he call a game where is there does it make sense the way we've seen others make sense? You know, I think there's the, all of that is open for severe. Um, you know, inspection, don't you think? Yes, I know. I agree. Like, you know, there's a lot of questions I have. I, I really want to follow up on it. Felt like the second Robinson got going was the second he was out of the game. So I didn't quite totally understand that. And we talked about this a lot. And this is going to be a problem when you have what I think are a lot of viable options to get the ball and some that almost you know, it mandates that you get the ball. A couple of weeks ago, we're like, Jahan Dotson's had three targets since he came out, you know, off of his hamstring injury. That's crazy. Like, we all know how good he is. And boom, it was like, they heard it. They woke up. They started targeting him. Touchdown, touchdown. Crazy 60-yard play. Like, it was like, you remembered he was there. Antonio Gibson last night, um, I know he had like nine or ten touches, but most of them were running the ball up the middle. And I'm sitting there going, okay, like, who on the Giants is covering him out of the backfield? Give me a break. Like, how did we lose sight of that happening, you know, last night? Um, they, and, and so I just think like, this is easy to complain about, but when they score 12 points and they have this group of position people, it is worth inspection to go, 
wait a minute, we need you to come up with different answers. This isn't last year where really the best, one of the best options consistently is JD McKissick, who's a very good player and a very crafty player, but not an explosive player. You know, like they have explosive players on this team and it's not happening for them week after week after week. And I appreciate that they're in all these games and they fight and they're resilient. That's really, I've come to grown accustomed to that under Rivera, that they're not, you're not, they're nobody's punching bag. Like you're going to be in a game with these guys. Like you're going to be in a very physical game with these guys. They're very prideful, but like, it's like they, it feels like on offense at times, they kind of just can't figure out what they're good at and stick with it. And they did it a couple times earlier, almost like it was demanded. They run the ball like exclusively for like a three week period. And now they've become more diverse again, but it's coming at the detriment of having what is, I feel an I a clear cut identity. And maybe that takes time to build, but it, it didn't feel that way in either one of these giants games at all. I also thought the Giants did a good job with their coverages. Um, compared to the last game, they definitely switched some things up. There were some def good disguises of man, then it's switching into a zone. And I thought that kind of messed with Washington a little bit. I know Washington tried to, their adjustment from the first game was a lot more spread and you know fewer tight ends in helping to block and spreading them. And we saw in the empty set, which resulted in a sack fumble. But so they did, so they'd adjusted. But I liked what the Giants did because you definitely saw that it, it kind of crossed them up a few times. And I, I give I give the Giants credit for I thought they did a nicely, nice, nicely coached job. Nicely coached job there. What, what the hell is the phrase I'm thinking about? It. There you go. Yeah, I, I think messed, like you know, I look at them and I go, you know, they've got a dynamic when Barkley's healthy, he's a dynamic elite player. And then I look around and I go, and who else and who are else? you overly concerned about? And, you know, they seem to be able to manage their way to the same amount of points that we put up every week, you know? And I mean, I think like they're working with what they have. So I want to give them credit, you know, like they, Daniel Jones in these two games against Washington, he was extraordinarily efficient in the first mm -hmm. game. And in this last one, they didn't come near him. So I give them in totality, a good amount of credit to adjusting. Um, I thought their game evolved from the first game a couple of weeks ago. You know, I fell prey to, the scheduling here where for once Washington was handed a layup, you know, like they're playing this yep. team, they get a bye week they have to play. You don't, you have to prepare for nobody else. I am still surprised that the result was what it I'm, was. I'm, I'm very surprised because um, I just, I thought they were the better team going into New York. I thought they were the better team going last night, thinking thinking that it would be a close game. Like, I never thought it was like, oh, I thought it was going to be a three or four point game in both cases, right? Yes. And and you're you're talking about a couple of plays that are made or not made. And if you, you know, you could hold on the ball in your own area, then this team could be could have been two and oh in those games. But you have no margin for error. I mean, that's right. the thing. And that was the point of what I went back to. And I'm like, and he when Rivera said, What's wrong with winning 17-16? Nothing, but you have no margin for error. Right. You're admitting that, that you have no margin for error. So all it takes is a terrible call on the goal line or someone taking a two-point conversion away from you or missing an extra point or a fumble inside the Giants 10 that ruins your chances, you know, because you cannot consistently put up an amount of points that would allow your defense a little bit of breathing room. You know, like... You know, there's these moments where you're sitting there going like, I can't believe the Giants had this 97 yard drive and they completed a fourth and nine, you know, like in the middle of it, like there's a couple of moments like that. But then think about in totality, they scored 13 offensive right. points. Am I right. really complaining about what the right. defense did <laughs> right like in the end? I mean, those are professional football players. That's Saquon Barkley, who when healthy is a Hall of Fame running back. Like, you know, like I'm not going to sit here and be like, oh, they should hold them to nothing every single week. At some point, your offense has to hold up the end of the bargain. Right. Well, are you and, and that's and that's the problem here going forward. Can they do it? Do you have confidence over the next three games that they can get to those? Because they agreed they need two wins. Can they get there? Yeah, I think they can. Um, you know, this weekend obviously is going to be tough. I mean, no doubt about it. But again, I've se I don't want to put anything past them. I've seen them do this a number of times where you're just like you totally write them off in a certain game, and they show up and they're either the tougher team or they make their own way and they win, um, or they figure out a game plan that works. Like in Philadelphia, that worked for them. Um, I do know that if they get no sacks and no turnovers this week against Brock Purdy, they will lose. So they better figure that one out. Like they better figure that one out fast. 
I will be very interested to see how San Francisco handles this. I think an underrated storyline here is, is the, is the best they can be is the two and the worst they can be is the three. So do they start managing their roster differently knowing that like they're kind of locked in right. three weeks in advance of the playoffs? Like, I don't know how Minnesota is going to be the same thing. Like, are they going to start rotating? Is McCaffrey only going to get 10 carries? Cause they don't want to, you know, they don't want to risk an injury with him. You know, like, I don't know. So like, we'll have to, maybe it's too early for that, but you don't know because that's where they sit. Like they're very locked into where they're going to be. So who knows how they're going to deal with the next few weeks. We're fighting for our lives. So that's a different mentality for sure. Um, and we'll have to see how it plays out. And then it's two home games, John, like that's how they're ending the season. It's two home games against one team that is out of the playoffs and another team that frankly is I can't imagine they're going to be playing anybody. They've already clinched the playoff spot and they can't win the division. So I like, like it's going to be Cooper rush. Like we know this. So why can't they win two of three? Oh yeah. And that's, that's the thing. If they don't, and here's the problem that I have, Brandon, if they don't make it this year with the schedule they had, that's a, that's a really, really disappointing season. You know, and- what's funny about that though. <laughs> what's really funny about that though is um, like with the schedule they had, uh, that Jacksonville game's looking a little different right now. They that had Detroit them at the right time. Is, though, <laughs> Detroit had, game's looking a little different right now. It did, but they still lost it. But there was also they played them at the right time because yeah. even when they played Jacksonville, I remember thinking like you do not want to play them later because you figure they get better, and the same with right. Detroit would get better. So it's more so when you're playing them, and then you play Dallas with with Cooper Rush the first time. And then you get this break with the Giants and you couldn't capitalize. And then, yeah. you know, so where and where are the Browns going to be with everything? And where, you know, well, Dallas, if you don't win that last that last game against Dallas, that's that's really bad. Now, I do think like you're right with this team is very, very resilient and has been under Rivera each of his, his two and a half years now. So I think, you know, I still think they can get there. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I think it's going to be interesting. Oh, I don't I, see why not. I mean, like oh, to end the season on two home games. I mean, yeah, you never, it's, it's silver right. plattered that's for what, you, and that's what I'm saying. That's yeah. what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, mean, I like, definitely think they can. Uh, listen, I think if they had won against the Giants, I think they were staring down. If you just win one of these next three, you're going to be in, and I think the pressure would have been taken off just a little bit, specifically this weekend against San Francisco, right. where nobody would be talking about do or die, even whether it's do or die or not. Um, you know, and. <laughs> You know, frankly, I mean, the Giants schedule, if you're looking for them to nosedive, they do get Minnesota this weekend, but then they play the Colts. And that's been terrible the last couple of weeks for them. And then they're going to end with Philadelphia, but who's Philadelphia playing? So if the Giants are playing for anything real, like Philadelphia is going to have all of their backups in. They're not going to risk anybody in that game. So that's a very, that feels very different than, than what it like looks like on the schedule a few weeks ago. So, I mean, like, Right now, they're playing for the seven. I think we all kind of get that. If they get two of the three, I think they will have a reasonable shot. All they're going to need is a Detroit loss, one Detroit loss, one Seattle loss. It might happen this weekend because they're playing Kansas City. So the road is right there for them. There's no reason to think the season is over. It's not. And if you're playing the last, like they may get the results they need this weekend to go, all right, just win your last two at home and you're good. And then at that point, you don't have any excuses if you're them. Correct. You're right. going to have to come through and do it. You're going to play an AFC opponent who's out of the playoff picture on January 1st at home. You better win that game if your playoff lives are on the line. A- absolutely. And I, I think that's that's kind of where I'm at with it as well. Um, are you concerned about the defense at all? Yeah, I have been, you know, like for, for a few weeks, I really felt like the Atlanta game to me really was eye-opening. I thought their run defense was... Finally, you know, I exposed is the wrong word, but like just a little more, um, a little more breakable than it had been, you know, like, it, like they had been so good up front. Um, and I think, you know, there's a couple things like, like, uh, granted, like Mario and Jones are very mobile quarterbacks and I don't think Purdy is going to be, and we'll have to see what Deshaun, I'm not really totally sure yet. We'll have to see what happens there, but like this guy's not going to run the ball down their throat or run a bunch of zone reads against them. So that's the good news. So that's different, but this might be the most dynamic best rush offense we've seen in the NFL. And, and so this is going to be an interesting test. And the, you know, for the first time I've been waiting for this to happen, like you can't just lose your leading tackler and one of the two viable linebackers you have on your team. And it not hurt you at some point. I think they have missed Cole Oakham for like the last, 
few weeks. Well, um, St. Juice as well. Big time. St. Juice has been a glaring miss. I mean, they, we knew they were thin at corner. Then they traded William Jackson. They got extremely thin at corner. They kind of couldn't lose him. And the Giants took advantage of this. I mean, they were they stayed away from Kendall Fuller and picked they on Danny targeted. Johnson because yep. they could. You know, like and so they need to get St. Juice back, obviously. Um, and I do feel like a little bit that it is a little bit after watching, and I need to rewatch the Giants game, but I do feel like they got to help the front a little bit. They've really carried the load for them. They've played a ton of snaps for them. A ton of snaps. I think they're I think they're gonna have to get a little more. I my my gut says they're gonna have to get a little more aggressive than maybe Jack Del Rio wants to be bring a little more heat to help them out. That's, that's how I kind of see it. But, you know, overall, again, have they had a, have they had what you would call a bad game? Cause I, I haven't seen it yet. It just hasn't been as good as it was. Well, you know, you know what it is, Br- you know, it is too, Bram. It's almost like they almost need to play perfect because you know, the offense is, is a right, cable. And so like any drive, it felt like, Oh my gosh, they had this, but you're right. 13 points. By the way, one thing I want to go back to the, and I want to go one more topic after this, but the one the one hard thing to look in the next three weeks is Detroit's schedule because they play Carolina, Chicago, and Green Bay. Green Bay. That's that's like now you know I could easily see them winning two of those. I could they're going to be they should they'll be favored in all three, but can they pull it off? That's going to be a tough one because it is hard to win. It's hard and they they played so well that will they have an, all they need is one slip up and the door opens for Washington because right now even though Washington's seventh. I mean, they can control their own fate by winning every game, but, you know, um, it starts with winning San Francisco. But anyways, I think, I mean, you has- know, look, you know, like the Carolina still is inexplicably in the NFC South and it is a home game. So we're rooting hard, obviously, for Carolina this weekend. And if they do that, it really kind of nullifies the result against San Francisco unless Washington wins. And then all of a sudden they're really in the driver's seat if they can pull this off on Saturday. So I'm going to I'm going to give a warning to everybody who is tired of this topic. We're going to talk about Chase Young for a couple minutes. So if you are <laughs> tired of it, thank you for making it to this point. I appreciate it. Catch you on, you know, you can tune in Thursday cuz I'll have Nick Wagner who covers the 49ers for ESPN. So I'll give you I'm going to count to 5 and then you can then we'll go back to the conversation. So <laughs> 1 1001, 1002, 1003, 1004, 1005. Okay, Chase Young. So Ron Rivera says he's going to play this year. I think it's time where they're going to say sink or swim. And I think they're, you know, my, I'm not pretty, well, I, I don't know. I mean, it, if he plays Saturday, I think it's a sink or swim situation. What, and he, Rivera also addressed that with the media today. And he's like, oh, it'd be great if guys who, you know, could come back and help us out down the stretch here. Well, you know what he's talking about. I mean, uh-huh. St. Juice is going to come back. St. Juice. But yeah. St. Juice, you know, St. Juice was I St. Juice was actually close this week. So I I actually feel like he will yeah, play. And I, but I don't doubt him, but like, but Chase, do you think, you know, Rivera said we'll see him. What do you think? Uh uh, well, I think they brought up Dr. James Andrews to meet with him to try to for reassure him. A yes. thousand percent. I think to try to reassure him. He's been medically cleared for a long time. Um, this is about him feeling comfortable in his own body and playing. Um, what they have seen at times is an unwillingness to protect himself to a degree that would concern them. You know, they don't want re-injury here. If he can't play the game at the speed that is necessary, he could get injured again. We know that. So he's got to feel comfortable in his own body. And I do, I'm, I'm a little surprised it's gotten this late in the game when they finally have ramped up, what sounds like a little bit of the pressure of, okay, oh, it's time to play definitely- because they, they've really stayed out of that. They've let the reporting happen where people would say he's coming back and then he's not coming back. And then it would, you know, spin cycle with that five weeks in a row. And, um, you know, I think for them, like for, for everyone who sits there and thinks like, why don't they just shut him down and just stop all this nonsense? Like, why, why would you do that? Like, unless you want the roster spot back, like, why would you do that? Like, it it might feel like a nuisance to you, but like, what's the difference to them? If he plays at some, like, you're not gonna shut him down. If you think he's going to play, they've consistently thought he was going to play. And now it does sound like publicly they're asking him to do it. And I, I'm not sure. I think to be honest, Bram, it could be as simple as chase. We're making you active and get out there and then, you know, and then just go see. And it could, it could be that kind of a situation. And just so he can see that, Hey, maybe it's not as bad as I thought. And I think the other problem too, is I think when you have those kind of injuries and you're right, like they brought Dr. Andrews up to reassure him 
your knee is okay. And so, because if, you know, in what's happening too, a lot of times the beginning of the week, he feels okay. And, you know, even coming off the bye, he felt good. I mean, you know, they, that's what they said by the end of the week, it's like, it starts to go down because maybe you get out there and you, you, you do something, you feel something in your knee. And is that, is it, what is it, you know, and you haven't gone through this. So you don't know, like, if you haven't gone through it before, you don't know what that, what that little twinge is t telling you. And, uh, but what it's, what's happening too, is if you're, if you get that and you just stop, well, now you're, you're jeopardizing yourself, but you're also not getting involved in the play. So I think you're going to get hurt. Yeah. You'll get hurt. But so, hurt. but I, but so the other could, people aren't stopping. You're right. And these, it could be as simple as too. again, put them out there and after, after a couple of plays, you say, you know what? I, I, I don't feel good. Well, then you take them out and you know, you know, and would that, would it hurt? For depth, yeah, it would. They would have to do some different things, but that may be some. And he's only going to play ten to fifteen snaps anyway. Uh, but yeah, that was is, the inter the interesting part about this whole thing was all along when when you know they kept saying he would play and then he wouldn't and then he played and he wouldn't. You know, I I can't really talk about what I see at practice because I have a little bit of you know more access. But um, I never thought it would be that much up until this point. You know, like even if they said he was going to play, it was like a handful of plays, like not a lot, and. You know, they hope that he would, you know, show a semblance of what he was pre-injury. They're pretty convinced he will at some point. I think we can all agree that that's most likely to happen um, next September. You know, yeah, <laughs> not, no, no, and, and not now. You I know, think, so, I think but, he has to accept the fact that he's not going to be who he thinks he is right away. You know, he can still be a presence. He can still go make a play. He's still an athletic um, marvel, so he can still go help them. He just won't be the Chase Young that he wants to be right away. And can he, ex can he accept that? I don't, you know, I, I think that would that be tough? You know, do you, you know, so I think there's a lot, there's a lot going on there, but you know, if Rivera says he's going to play, if he, I mean, he was pretty sure on that. And I know he's been sure before, but not after a game like that, that was, that was different. And that was like, yeah. you know what? It's time. Yep. Yeah. And I, I, you know, I can't crawl into the guy's body. I don't know. You know, like only head, he yeah. knows only his doctors know I have to assume he would have had second opinions from his own doctors. Um, and if there was an issue with him being cleared, I'm sure we would have heard about it. So I think he's medically cleared and yeah. I totally understand the, you know, nervousness and reluctance of doing that again. I totally get I mean, it. But like he's hard. a professional football player and he's a really, really high level one. So I know they're hoping to get him back. And I'm assuming he's coming back sooner rather than later. Well, for those of you who stuck around for the Chase Young conversation, I appreciate it. So, Bram, that was that that was painless. So I hope people have survived that okay. So I appreciate it, everybody. Anyway, that's it, Bram. Thanks for thanks for coming on as always. All right, see ya. That's it for this episode. Thanks to Bram for joining me, and thank you as always for listening. I'll be back with another episode Thursday when I talk to ESPN's Nick Wagner about the 49ers. But we also kind of go into, there's always been these comparisons between the franchise, where are the Niners at? Because what the Niners are doing, their blueprint is what Washington, I think, would like to follow and has kind of been following. So what what is it that, that Nick thinks that Washington might be missing that the Niners really have? And I think there's one area that you guys won't be surprised by. Anyway, that'll be out Thursday. So I will talk to you next time.